This is the first of four videos looking at sort of the history of transportation in America. And in this first video, we'll look at the colonial era. I first want to start with why people colonized, and transportation certainly involved in that story. At the, after uh, the Middle Ages, and you get the Renaissance, and people begin to trade, and nation states are forming, and a lot of this uh, trading that they had was over the old Silk Road, the, the road to China and India, where there were spices and uh, drugs and things that Western Europe didn't have but wanted. And the desire for those products during the Renaissance helped lead to this these trading routes. And uh, it's going to be absolutely integral in, in the uh, drive to colonization. Also integral in the drive to colonization was a a better type of sailing boat called the Caravel. It was uh, small, relatively small, but it was uh, sleeker than existing boats and could travel faster and still carry a sizable amount of material. When the old overland trade routes, the old Silk Road to China and India was blocked in the 15th century by growing Islamic movements, you get Portugal a European country decides to use the caravel and see if they can go around the land that was to the south of them, which of course is the continent of Africa. And of course they reach India and confirm that it's now, you know, more profitable to do this trade by sea. And so with all the caravels going around the Cape of Good Hope at the bottom of South Africa, you get prosperity and, and new trading routes coming to Europe. As I say, this this was the Renaissance, and there's a rise of humanism, and people were thinking critically, and they uh, kind of looking at astronomy and figured out that the world was, educated people anyway, figured out that the world was round, and they were creating globes, and the thought was that if uh, you can't go east because the old trade routes overland are blocked, and Portugal is not going to let the rival nation states use their water route, to go around, to, you know, Africa, maybe we could get to India and China by going west because the world's round. And of course, that would lead us to Columbus and the discovery of the new world. So, uh, you know, the, the improvements in transportation and knowledge of the Renaissance certainly helped led to uh, discovery of the Americas. Of course, when they discovered the Americas, there were people living there, the Native Americans. And Native Americans did have established, recognizable trails in some areas. I was looking for one on the internet. I couldn't find one. This one here, you can kind of see a wagon wheel, so I didn't a true Indian trail. But you can envision a, an area where you could discern the bushes that cut back. And that would be indicative of, of a recognizable Indian trail. One of the uh, first types of Indians to meet the the uh, new arrivals from Europe were, of course, the East Coast Indians, and among them were the Algonquin-speaking Indians along the coast, and they were especially adept at building birch bark canoes. They would carve them out and use fire, and uh, they could travel great distances for trading and fishing in these canoes. Now, if you were to go out in the Great Plains, of course, there are different Indians, different environment, and they, uh, they lived in teepees. Now, these teepees, these Indians were, were nomadic following the buffalo herd. The teepees could be disassembled and used as sleds when following the buffalo migrations. Before European colonization, there weren't horses, so they'd uh, pull these sleds just by hand. But obviously, after the Europeans arrived and horses came out to the Great Plains, they would pull the, uh, the sleds themselves. Interestingly, no Indian tribes at the time of European colonization had a wheel. I just mentioned horses. Well, there was originally a form of a horse that had probably evolved in the Americas, but it wiped out by the first migration of people uh, thousands of tens of thousands of years before the arrival of Europeans. When the Europeans arrived, they brought their horses, modern horses, with them, and they became they were bred and became feral. And uh, you know, very quickly, the, the horses transformed the Indians' life on the Great Plains. Now, looking, turning our attention to these people that were coming to the New World in the uh, 
16th century, the 1500s, and the 17th century, the 1600s. Uh, you know, during during the 17th century, the 1600s, voyages across the Atlantic were really perilous endeavors. The ships were relatively slow and small, and people would really just cram in. And the bottom, you would see the storage and and the the living space is really not not very uh you know you don't have much of it above it. A voyage could take many months, and sometimes uh, ships leaving you know at the same time could arrive many weeks apart. You know if they arrived at all, storms could easily swamp or sink these vessels. Navigation was by the use of a sextant or just flat dead reckoning on the stars. Meat would go bad, and the lack of fruits could lead to the disease of scurvy. You know, keep in mind there are no bathrooms, and people would have to bathe on deck, so it was pretty smelly and all around nasty. I said these uh, early colonists arriving on these uh, caravels was a long and perilous and dangerous voyage. Keep in mind that these immigrants had little concept of the Atlantic hurricane season, and so they could be caught by surprise and imagine being in one of those little caravels with, in the middle of a hurricane. Of course, when the English arrived, they put their settlements along the water, and uh, every settlement had a wharf. Here's a picture of one of the earliest uh, depiction of, uh, you know, like a, a similar fort to Jamestown in Virginia. But you always had a wharf, and and these these settlers did not live far in the interior. They didn't have roads. They just used the Indian uh, paths if they if they went hunting. As these early colonists in the 17th century grew, they grew along these rivers, and the, the rivers were, were like the major highways. They would row from plantation wharf to plantation wharf. Ocean going, these rivers, especially in the south, were ocean were wide rivers, and ocean going vessels could actually dock at the docks of, of these uh, wharfs. Because of both the environment, a, a cold, rockier, a cold winter and a longer winter in a rockier soil, and a communal spirit embedded in the early religious immigrants like the Puritans, the New England colonies developed towns, which soon had well-developed roads connected them to facilitate trade and defense. So as these colonies grew in the north, where there was a, a sense of community in towns, roads developed between the, the towns. And things, as I just said, were different in the South. A lot of the South had a wide tidewater, as shown here in, in green in the Virginia colony, and thus a lot of really good arable land. And I've already mentioned with few good harbors, but these wide rivers, the South developed a pattern of large landed estates or plantations and fewer towns. And of course, as the South developed and these plantations got larger, they grow along the rivers and they're mostly self-sufficient and they all maintained their individual wharfs. The lack of towns and the smaller populations, again, meant fewer roads in the South. River travel, well, whether you're going up to plantation wharfs or city wharfs, it extended only as far as what they call the falls. Uh, that's where you know the water flows down from the mountains and rocks tumble down, and at some point they begin to pile up these rocks and uh, when, they, when the river begins to flatten out near the Piedmont. And that is considered the falls because the water falls over the, the ledge of these rocks. And often these colonial people would put towns at the falls because that was as far as a boat could go up. Now, you know, if time passed, and by the 18th century or the 1700s, obviously ships had improved. They're larger and they're faster than the earlier caravels, but the journey still remained hazardous and long. They'd learned how to, to use the uh, Gulf Stream to speed up their travel in the Atlantic, and they had new devices to tell time, and thus had a better estimate of how far they had gone. By the 18th century, a number of lighthouses appeared. Rivers and harbors were better mapped, and ship pilots were familiar with water depths and hazards. Some colonial ports even had laws preventing dumping that might block passage from ships. Now, by the 18th century, these northern towns had grown, and some of them grown quite large, uh, mostly obviously led by New York City in the north. Uh, these towns tended to generally grow haphazardly, and the roads were narrow, and they were congested, and it, it could really be dangerous, especially 
especially at night in these on these narrow winding roads in these in these big cities. Philadelphia was the exception. It was unusual in that it was planned in a, a grid fashion beforehand and didn't grow up haphazardly. The streets were straight and wide. And uh, to a lesser extent, Charleston and South Carolina Colony also grew up as sort of more of a planned community. The roads were not quite as treacherous. Of course, the English wanted to profit from their colonies and uh, they wanted the colonies raw materials and they wanted the colonies to buy things the colonists needed only from their country, not from the rivals of the mother country. And so this was uh, the, the policy of mercantilism and it mandated that these mother countries like England would want to control trade with the colonies. And England did this by having what was called navigation acts. All trade the English Navigation Act declared had to be in English ships and uh, an English captain and a crew that was three-fourths English. You know, once a ship took off, you, you couldn't make sure that it was, you didn't have GPS or anything. You couldn't make sure it was going to where it said it was going. But if you had an English captain and an English crew, that maybe you, that you could hope they'd be more responsible. They, the Navigation Acts would list what they call enumerated articles, important articles that could only be exported out of the colonies directly to England. And all trade from Europe first had, of course, to travel through England. Again, this was ensuring that any type of wealth in the trade passes through England. So that was very strict control of transportation and trade. Now, if you're going to build a ship or you're going to build uh, what's needed for these, this trading, the colonists very quickly are used to uh, make what's called naval stores. If you have like a, a pine tree, more in the, in the south and north, you, you, you can scrape it. It kind of has a sticky substance in it. And if you scrape these trees, you get, like I said, turpentine. And that was what was used to make naval stores. And these so-called naval stores were painted onto wooden ships and the wooden barrels that were used to waterproof them for the long journeys. A lot of the old growth forest in Europe had been wiped out over the centuries, and they didn't have as many of these huge big trees. Now, in the north, in the New World, there were these old growth big trees, you know, huge northern trees, perfect for mass building. And also with all these uh sort of pine trees with, with turpentine, it was great for the naval stores industry. And not surprisingly, the end result of all of this was a big shipbuilding industry grew in the north. Of course, a, a big shipbuilding industry in the north would eventually be a, sort of a challenge to the shipbuilding industry in England. It didn't fit well into the mercantilistic system and will contribute to the American Revolution. But I should note by, by the 1700s, the 18th century, northern roads between these towns had grown quite extensive and they were well traveled and they included things like bridges and, and where there weren't bridges there were regular ferries. A traveler in uh, the 18th century colonial America in the north could stay at inns and these inns would have uh, a room on the front where you could get food or beverage social area and on the, the bedrooms are on the top and they'd have one for men and, and one for women. Here's an old uh, an old colonial era tavern. Obviously the, the cars this is a picture taken recently. There weren't cars. But uh, these inns were uh, well known and uh, popular in the north along the uh, most well-traveled roads between towns. By the 18th century in the north you had regular stagecoach uh, travel between uh, these towns. It left at a certain time and uh, was expected at a certain time and you could pay a fee and go between towns without having your own horse or your own wagon. Now the transportation of goods overland during the 17th century, the 1600s, had been by trains of uh, pack horses or mules. By the end of the colonial era in the 18th century, the 1700s, however, Conestoga wagons were popular, kind of like the 18-wheelers of their day, pulled by between four and six horses. I mean, they could carry a lot of weight, up to four to six tons. They had high angled sides to prevent goods from falling out. Looms stretched side to side to support a heavy cloth overhanging to protect the goods. Conestoga wagons were, however, very expensive, and uh, most small businesses, of course, could not afford them.
I had mentioned earlier that the uh, caravels in the late 15th and early 16th century had given way to larger ships by the 18th century. Well, by the end of the colonial period, near the 18th, the end of the 18th century, ocean-going vessels had just gone tremendously larger than they were only a hundred years or so before. They were faster, sleeker, and they, could, and they could go further. But in the 18th century, of course, if you're in the north, travel anywhere, you know, could be slowed by the weather. I guess that's true everywhere. I mean, with mud in the south, but especially winter in the north, if it were snowy and icy, you really couldn't go far, roads or otherwise. The first significant road throughout the South was the so-called King's Road. It was constructed in part by the Crown, the King of England, in the late 17th century and early 18th century. And you can see a map of it here. It kind of roughly parallels, you might say, the Interstate 95 today. By the end of the colonial era, the end of the 18th century, additional roads had extended in the South but they were hardly equal to the quality and number of roads throughout the north. At places, they could, they could even be impassable. I should note that throughout the colonial era, whether you're talking the 17th century, the 1600s, or the 18th century, the 1700s, settlers were constantly pushing westward into the wilderness. And if they didn't follow an Indian trail, what they would do uh, would blaze their own paths for others to follow. When I say blaze, they would notch marks in trees and cut out the most uh, egregious obstructions. Uh, so followers coming after them could see where to go. And you can see this is an historical sign of the three notched road. I guess a tree been notched three times. But this was a constant process. The first cutting edge of people going westward would have to follow Indian trails or blaze their own trail. By the 18th century, people were uh, crossing over the Appalachian Mountains. And they did that by uh, traveling along roads that had been blazed through the uh, Cumberland Gap, which was a, a part of the Allegheny Mountains where the mountains weren't that high. And uh, one of the first people to go through there was a man named Daniel Boone. And uh, he was hired by a land speculator who was trying to get people to move into the land the speculator bought in what became Kentucky. And uh, so Boone would lead people in this so-called wilderness road through the Cumberland Gap in the mountains. And so that was like the highway of its day moving west of the Appalachian Mountains in the early 18th century. Now, of course, while the first people out in the west were, were explorers and uh, you couldn't be a uh, land speculator unless you had you know, ownership of the land and you knew what was out there. So very quickly on the heels of explorers were the spread of, of these surveyors westward. And that way they could uh, document on a plat or a map what was out there and they could subdivide it into lots that could be sold and bought. So the, the, this process of the country spreading westward, westward, you know, initially it's Indian trails and blazing and then, uh, you know, people follow established uh, routes and as time passed these routes would widen and uh, eventually traveling merchants began selling their goods to settlers that were further in and you begin to see more and more people and merchant stores developed and towns developed and pretty soon it's not the frontier but again the process is continuing it just it doesn't stop in any event this concludes the uh, first video on transportation this one focusing on colonial America